Imagine you're going down to the park. Maybe you're taking a friend's child with you, a nephew, a niece, maybe it's your own child. But you go down to the park, you open the gate, and the little child runs towards the swing. As they're running, another child runs up to them and just pushes them over. And that other child's parent is there, but they do nothing. That story just gives you a little glimpse of how Habakkuk is feeling. Last week, we looked at the first of Habakkuk's complaints. Within it, he challenged God. He said, God, you're idle. You're not doing anything. He said back in verse 2, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? And the Lord replied that he was doing something through the suffering and evil of this world. He was working. And we saw that most clearly when we looked at the cross of Christ. How through that terrible suffering, through that terrible event, God used it to save us. And now here we are again. Habakkuk has another complaint. And this time he complains, why don't you deal with evil? Why don't you do something about it? But one thing you'll notice as you read through this complaint is he starts it differently. This time his complaint is based on what he knows about God rather than how he feels about evil. Let's look together, verse 12 to 13. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. He says, God, you're so great. I know all these truths about you. I know they're true. And so in Habakkuk's mind, it leads to a perfectly reasonable question, which he asks, why do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Why, Lord, why do you tolerate them? Why do you let them attack people? If you're so holy and mighty and righteous, why let them continue? He seems to have a disconnect between what he knows about God that is true and what he sees in the world. And he can't make sense of it. How does it all add up? And so he goes on to describe these wicked people in really vivid imagery. He describes them like a super trawler. You know, one of those massive fishing boats, they're about sort of hundreds of meters long. A monstrous machine, there's one there. The Guardian ran an article on them and said they're making a mockery of our seas because their nets go out and they stretch for a mile and they pick up anything and everything in their path. In one year alone, they caught 1,100 porpoises, which are basically mini dolphins. They They just destroy anything. And you can imagine the net sawing through the sea and claiming everything on its way. And that's how Habakkuk describes them. Let's have a look together. You have made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net for by his net he lives, uh, and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? When, God, are you going to deal with them? Are they going to keep on going? Really? They trust in their own strength. They worship themselves. Did you notice the language of sacrifice and incense? And what do they do it to? Their own net. And remember back last week to verse 11. They're described as guilty people whose own strength is their God. And so Habakkuk, he comes to God, he has a complaint. He wants evil destroyed for two reasons. One is because of who God is. And the other is because of how they're hurting other people. 
Because God is holy and from everlasting, and these people, they don't recognize that. They worship themselves and hurt others in the process. Well, let's see what the Lord's answer is. We'll split it into two parts. The first is verses, one, um, verses 2 to 5, and then from verses 6 to 20 of chapter 2. So here's our first point, which is keep going. Keep waiting. Verses 2 to 5. The Lord, he speaks. He speaks straight into the complaint of the, um, of the Lord being silent. So remember verse 13. What was it Habakkuk said to God? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? And here we are, the Lord is speaking because he's present in the pain. And this is what he says in verse 2. Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks at the end and it will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. It will come. That's what the Lord wants us to take from these verses. It will not delay. There is a day when it all will be sorted. We'll see that more in a moment, but it's just to know that there is a set time. And the Lord continues describing the time now whilst we wait. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Indeed, wine betrays him. He's arrogant and never at rest because he's greedy as the grave, and like death is never satisfies. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captives all the peoples. So there's a difference between the wicked and the righteous even now. The wicked is never satisfied. Do you see that? It describes them as never at rest, because they're greedy as the grave, always wanting more, more, more. And you only have to look out at the world and the messages it gives. It might just simply be the need of the next car, the next house, the next something bigger or better or, or something else, something that means we're never actually satisfied. Materialistic view of the world. See, Habakkuk, he says they live in luxury and enjoy the choicest of food. And actually the Lord says, you know, they're not actually ever satisfied. They're not happy. They're not filled. The wicked are prepared to take anything and everything. And an extreme example is dictators, always wanting more. More land, more money, more people, more power. The enemy is puffed up. That's how the Lord describes them. Well, what about the righteous? It's down there in verse 4. They live. The righteous person will live by his faithfulness. They live even now. They're different now as they wait for the revelation um, as, at the end because they live by his faithfulness. They don't live by works. The Lord saves these people because they believe in him and in the one he sent, his son, Jesus Christ. Because they trust in him and his blood to take away their sin. They can have a father in heaven. They can live and the Lord, he tells Habakkuk to write down these verses because this whole section is to keep us going. Because we know the Lord has spoken. We know he's present in our pain. And there is a point where this will all end and we'll be fully, truly satisfied forever. And for the people of Judah, this is what they would have had to keep them going as Babylon invaded. They'd have had to keep clinging to this truth that one day God would um, source it at the end. And we too need to cling to this truth. But not only this truth, but the Lord has spoken to us, not only through the prophet Habakkuk, but also through his son, Jesus. See, the righteous live by his faithfulness. And we know that Jesus, the fully righteous one, is alive now. He rose from the dead. He was seen by hundreds and ascended into heaven 
We can trust God's word. We know we can live because he lives. Keep going. Keep waiting. The end is coming. What, though, will happen to the wicked? That's our next point. Woe to the wicked. Woe to the wicked. It's because of the future. It's because it's certain in verse 6. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule? And, as in all of them taunt him, as in the righteous will do the taunting. They'll taunt the wicked with ridicule and scorn, saying... And then we get them, these five sets of woes. Let's see them together. Verse 6. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. Verse 9. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the the clutches of ruin. Verse 12. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town with injustice. Verse 15, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbours, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk so that he can gaze at their naked bodies. And verse 19, Woe to him who says to wood, Come to life, or to life the stone, wake up. As you work through these verses, these are all the things the wicked are doing. With their dragnet in their super trawler, as they trust in their own might and strength, as they pay no attention to God, as they swallow up the righteous, yet woe. Woe to them. Why woe? Because it will catch up with them. That's the next part of the pattern If we work back through those five again, woe to him who piles up stolen goods. Then let's look together. Verse 7, why woe? Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Imagine being the wicked, being Babylon. Everyone they've ever taken from, everyone they've stolen from, suddenly at the door, knocking at the door, being like, give it back. It's not yours. I can see why Babylon's described as trembling in that moment. Well, then again, let's go down to verse 11. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain. Verse 11 says, The stones of the wall will cry out, and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. There's no escape. Even the building Babylon built, it will speak of the evil that's been done. Babylon, you think no one's watching. But they were. And then we have verse 15. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor. And then verse 16. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming round to you. The cup of wrath. Woe to him who uses people who thinks he can get what he wants and get away with it. It's wrong. Wrath is coming because of it. And verse 19. Woe to him who says to word, come to life. Because ultimately, can it give guidance? Can it help people? No. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. See, God is the only God. He's in his temple. All these idols that the Babylonians are trusting in, their own might, their own net, what they were burning sacrifices to and incense, they worship themselves. And yet, um, and yet that is nothing because it is not God. And the thing is, our world teaches us that that's the way to live, to live for ourselves. I was in KFC on the way home from Derbyshire a few weeks ago, and I heard a lady explain to her children that you've got to blow your own trumpet because no one else will. So the world is full of I, I, I. It's the new idol, it's something else to live for that's not God. And they don't work, idols. That's why all the earth will be silent before the Lord in verse 20. Trust in him. As we've been working through this list, you may have noticed I actually missed one out right in the middle. Let's just have a look at it together now. Verses 12 to 14. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. 
Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire? That the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There is a judgment day where everything done in sin, everything done for ourselves and not for God, where that will be removed. Because Habakkuk, actually, he was right about God when he said in his complaint, Are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. See, God is holy and he cannot tolerate wrongdoing. And there is a day, a certain day, where his glory will fill the whole earth as the waters cover the sea. When you go down to the beach, when you go down, when you saw in Norfolk, you're stood out there, you're looking out at the sea, the waters are everywhere. This is Eccles on sea. But there's, you go out and it's everywhere. You look left, you look right. That's how Habakkuk describes what it'll be like when God's glory is everywhere on this earth. You can't see anything else. And what a marvelous, glorious, amazing picture that is of that day. And you see, the thing is, because God's glory is everywhere, there cannot be any evil there. Evil is nowhere to be seen. And that verse, verse 14, this verse, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, it's actually a quote from Isaiah. And whereas Habakkuk takes this quote and Habakkuk shows us that evil can't be there, Isaiah takes the quote and shows us what it would be like on the other viewpoint. So let me just read you these verses from Isaiah 11. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together. The little child will lead them. The cow will uh, feed with the bear, the young will lie down together, the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young children will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. A little child will lead the lion. The wolf and the lamb will be friends. That's why evil can't be there. That's why it's a woe to those who live in sin. That's why there is a judgment. Because God is the parent that does go and deal with the child that pushes over the other child. God goes there and says, no, that's not right. Evil doesn't belong in a world, and so God is doing something about it. He's present in the pain. Going back to verses 2 and 3, he says, Write down the revelation, make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. One question you may be asking yourself is, why hasn't he stopped it yet? Well, to answer that question, we might just have to uh, jump into another letter to to Peter where someone asked him that very question. And this is the answer. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, the day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He waits so that people can come to Jesus, repent of their sin, believe, have their sins forgiven, and have an eternity with him. If he hadn't have waited, if he had ended the world a thousand, two thousand years ago, we wouldn't have had the chance to get to know him. It's actually in his mercy that he keeps it going. Maybe you're sat there today and you're not a Christian. And maybe you don't believe in Jesus. Maybe it's all been a lot to take him. Talk of judgment. Please do come and talk. Please do come and hear more about the God who doesn't let evil win. The God who saves. The God who forgives sin. The one who makes us right with him so we can be with him forever in a world where there won't be any evil where his glory covers the um, earth like the waters cover the sea Habakkuk complained why don't you deal with evil God 
And the Lord answered and said, keep going, keep waiting, because one day there will be a woe to the wicked. One day evil will be dealt with for good. The Lord has spoken. He will judge. He will fill the earth. And on that day, the righteous will live by faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Let us pray.